This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Our scriptural lesson for today comes from the 10th chapter of the Gospel according to Dr. Luke, uh, and then verse 17 through verse 20, reading from the New International Version of Scripture. Notice there these words. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will hurt, harm you. However, do not rejoice that, your, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. I want to talk today from the subject, curse breakers. Curse breakers. Uh, these are 72 disciples that Jesus authorized and commissioned to go out and to do marvelous works in his name. This is what I would call the multiplication of ministry. Jesus was only one person, but Jesus himself was the master teacher who then produced rabbis. One of the things is that uh, Jesus was a leader. Leaders produce other leaders because they reproduce after their own kind. Uh, so that there's a twofold test of leadership. Uh, a leader is a leader when there are others that follow. But also a leader is a leader when those who follows rise up and emerge as leaders themselves. He or she who thinks uh, that he or she leads and nobody follows only takes a walk. So if you are called to do something, the fruit that you were called to do it is that fruit multiplies because fruit has a seed in it. Jesus multiplied followers who ultimately became leaders because a disciple is a, is a learner who then makes other disciples. You're not a disciple just because you learn. A disciple makes other disciples. Jesus raised disciples and here he has commissioned 72 disciples and he gave power to them, authority to be able to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cast out devils. He gave them power. And now they are coming back with a glorious report. They are ecstatic and excited by the fact that the demons are subject unto them through the name of Jesus. They're excited about it. And Jesus says to them, hey, 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 hey. Uh, you're rejoicing over the wrong thing. Don't rejoice over the fact that demons are subject to you, but rejoice over the fact that your names are written in heaven. Now, you know, it took me a long time to gain some understanding of that because, you know, I mean, if Jesus gave me power and I saw that power working like, woo, you know, I mean, I'm going to be pretty excited about that myself. Knowing that I'm saved when I go out to start the work. But Jesus said, hey, 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 don't get excited by what happened through the use of the power of my name and the power that I have given to you. Don't get excited about that, but you get excited because your name was written in heaven. And, and I want you to understand what Jesus is saying to them. Let, let me see if I can put it in, in, in simple terms to you so you can understand uh, his correction here of their excitement. They're excited because... They go out and, and say, in the name of Jesus, and, and folks are healed. 
And in the name of Jesus, and demons are coming out. They are excited. They come out, man, you know, they, they were smelling themselves. And, and Jesus said, hey, don't, don't get excited over that power stuff that has worked out because you obeyed me. And you operated under a God-given authority, an impartation that came into your life. He says, I want you, if you're going to get excited, get excited over the fact that your names are written in heaven. Here's the way that I would translate that in my own terms. Don't get excited about what you do for God. Get excited about what God has done for you. That's what he was telling them. This is not about what you do. You don't get into heaven because you've done all the right works. There are people that are going to be doing the works and then they don't have the right relationship with him rejoicing over the blood and the redemption that God has already provided for them. And he's going to say to them, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I don't even know you. So it's not about what you did. It's about what he has done for you. So I want you, I hope that that opens that up in a little different understanding. It is not about what you do for him. It's about what he has done for you. This is the cause of, of rejoicing. This is, I want you to understand that in context. This is not to say that we don't serve him with our works. It is faith and works. We understand that. But don't get excited about, more excited about what you do for him than what he has done for you. That he died for you, that he gave his blood for you, for your redemption, to be able to break the power of the enemy off of your life. So Jesus was just reminding us to let the cause of your rejoicing be over the fact that you're saved, that you're going to go to heaven, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, and that, that you're in, in right standing with Jesus Christ. It is interesting that... In other religions, uh, I've, I've been to the eastern parts of the world and what, they have tons of gods. I went into one temple there and there were 13 gods lined around. And, and the people had brought food and, and libations and, and all kinds of things to offer to these gods. And, and oftentimes, in, in, in times of antiquity, they would kill things and present it to their god. Because other religions, other idols, require that something else be broken and killed and offered to it. But Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. So it's not about what you do for him. It's about what he has done for for you what he has done for you. Uh, I want you to notice in Matthew chapter 7, notice verse 22 and 23. Jesus says to us, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. See, Jesus is saying, this is not about what you do for me. This is about what I've done for you. Because you've got uh, have to have, to have a, a relationship with me. You've got to have a relationship with me. You can't assume just because somebody is anointed to do ministry. Anointing is to fulfill God's purpose. Anointing is not an endorsement of anybody's character. And so I want you to see here what, what, what God is saying. Uh, he's saying, I, I want you to have relationship with me. Don't get excited about stuff that you do. Get excited about the relationship that you are as a result of what he has already done. Let me say it to you this way. Your works for God don't replace your worship of God. Your works for God. Don't replace your worship of God. Well, Lord, I sing in the choir. I sing on the worship team. Listen, your works for God don't replace your worship of God. Even those that lead worship on the platform have to have a relationship with God when there are no lights and when there is no platform. I mean, we, you, you, you can't, this is not something that you do when the lights turn on. Uh, it, it, this is who we are. Praise is, is what we do. I want you to think of yourself like a fish down at the Georgia Aquarium. Do you think that when people come to the aquarium that, that, that the fish start, uh, you know, nudging each other? Say, uh, <clears throat> wait a minute, they're here now. Come on, let's do what we do. 
Oh, they're going to do what they do whether you're looking or not. Because that's who they that's who they are. So when you have been redeemed by God, you're redeemed whether anybody is looking or not, whether the lights are on or not, whether the curtains are opened or not. That's just who you are based on what he has done. It's, so we just do what we are. We, we do what we are based on what he has already done on our behalf. And so again, this is a reminder for us to rejoice in what he has done for us more than what we do for him. You're, you're not going to get brownie points with God if you have not received and accepted in your life the lamb that was slain for you before the foundation of the world, telling the Lord, you know, Lord, I, I built a big ministry. Lord, you know, I talked to people on my job about you. Lord Jesus, you know, I went and fed people under the bridge and I did this and I did that. And I, God's not interested in what you did. He's interested in what he has done on your behalf and whether you received that and then gave that away to others. And so, um, that's the power of the blessing of God. We are called to be curse breakers. Jesus gave these disciples power to be able to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the lepers, to open the eyes of the blind. Jesus gave them power to undo the works of the devil, to break curses that were on God's people. They found a girl that had been bent over. You know, for 18 years and said, ought not this daughter of Abraham be loosed from her infirmities? And, and Jesus set her free. He set her free. He set her free. And really what he did, he informed her of what Jesus had already done. He, he simply said to her, woman, thou art loosed. You're already loosed. He informed her of the finished work. That was finished from the beginning of time. He says, you're already loosed. And immediately, this woman was free. She was able to stand up straight for the first time in 18 years. It's, it's amazing. If God blessed us, and he did, because when God created Adam and Eve, before he ever told them to multiply, guess what he did to them? He blessed them. And then he said to them, be fruitful, multiply, replenish, and subdue. He blessed them and then he said to them, I just want you to understand this. God has no expectations of you before he blesses you. Because he wants whatever that comes out of your life to be a blessing. So before God did anything, before he expected Anything out of Adam and Eve before he gave them any instruction, he blessed them. You're blessed even if you're not fruitful. Blessing is the power to be fruitful. God blessed them before they ever had a child. They were already blessed when they were childless. He blessed them before they had any kind of material prosperity. So why do you measure whether you're blessed or not? By material stuff. God blessed them before he gave them any command to be fruitful, prosperous, and then to multiply, and then to replenish or to subdue. God blessed them. God blessed them. And God has blessed you. But then you see people bound up by stuff and you wonder, where did we get off course? Where on earth did we get off course because we've been blessed by God? You know... In Numbers chapter 23, a man by the name of Balak hired a prophet of God who was not an Israelite, but he was a prophet of God. He hired uh, uh, Balaam to actually curse the children of Israel, God's chosen people. And, and, and you know the story of what happened. Uh, Balaam came back and, and he said, excuse me. I mean, I know your money is good and everything. And, you know, I know I can cash the check, but... But I, I can't curse what God has blessed. I mean, he, this man, he was not a, an Israelite, but he was a prophet of God. And he knew. Uh, he, he said it in Numbers chapter 23, verse 8. I can't curse what God has, has blessed. He knew he couldn't curse God's people because God had blessed them. 
But guess what? While Balaam had no power to curse what God had blessed, the people still got themselves in a bind and brought a curse on themselves. While others can't curse you, you can curse yourself. Even when God has blessed you, you can curse yourself. Whenever God's people connect with the forbidden, we contaminate and curse ourselves. Whenever you connect with the forbidden, uh, we contaminate and, and then we curse ourselves. And that's exactly what they did. You know why? Because they, they began to connect with uh, the Moabite women. And the Moabite women worshipped other gods. And the next thing you know, the Moabite women had them worshipping their idol gods. And they cursed themselves and God brought a plague upon them, a curse on them. And 24,000 of them dropped dead. And yet a prophet of God had no power to curse them. But yet their own rebellion and disobedience cursed themselves. You're, it's something that even when others can't curse you because God has blessed you, you can curse yourself. You'd be surprised about how many people have cursed themselves. The Bible reminds us, the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Ephesus reminds us in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27, give no place to the devil, neither give place to the devil. Uh, the other versions say neither give opportunity to the devil don't give the devil an opportunity and you know in your life what gives an opportunity for the devil to come in if you know you're weak around so and so keep your distance don't give opportunity to the devil but well, you know what I mean I, I was just uh, you know he just said he just wanted to talk Uh, he just asked me, could he put his hand on my leg? <laughs> Neither give place or opportunity to the, to the devil. And see, yet that plague, when it broke out among the children of Israel, in Numbers chapter 25, verse 9, 24,000 of them saw their death. When nobody else could curse them, they still held the power to curse themselves. So our own rebellion can bring a curse. But I want to make this perfectly clear to you. A person who has done no wrong to another person cannot be the victim of his or her curse. I want you to rest assured in that. That a person who has done no wrong to another person cannot be the victim of his or her curse curse. Sometimes people get spooked out by people because they know, you know, so-and-so is a witch, a warlock. Yet, let, let me just tell you, they don't have any power. If you've not done anything against them, they have no power to be able to curse you. Undeserved curses have no effect on people. And uh, so if we abide in Christ, if we do God's will, if we do not harm others, they cannot harm us. Uh, let me give you the scripture for that. Proverbs chapter 26 and verse 2. Notice this. Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2. Notice this. Don't worry when someone curses you for no reason. Nothing bad will happen. Such words are like birds that fly past and never stop. Now that's good news. That is good news. Don't worry when someone curses you for no reason, nothing bad will happen. Such words are like birds that fly past and never stop. Now, there are some people that are jealous of you and they think that they have the power to curse you, but they don't. Because it's like, you know what? I don't even know you. I haven't even done anything like, uh, you know, against you. You know, it's just sometimes the spirit of God that's in you that, in, that, that irritates the demons that's in them and then they want to curse you, but they have no power to curse you. When you walk upright, no good thing will God withhold from those that walk upright. I'm just telling you, you have a favor of God. The favor of God brings the shalom of God. The shalom of God is not just peace. It is prosperity. It is safety. It is protection divinely brought by the power of God on your life. It's amazing. 
But if you ever go back and see about where the generational curses began, because God has called us to be curse breakers. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, notice this. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. God warns us that he's a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate him. And I know that it sounds unfair for God to punish uh, the, sin, uh, the children for the sins of, of the fathers, but uh, it, there's more to it than what meets the eye here. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that the effects of sin, the effects of sin are naturally passed down from one generation to another. The effects of sin. The effects of sin. Poverty is a curse of the law. And I'm not saying that poor people are evil. Uh, I'm just saying that it's, you know, if you have a choice of being destitute or having an abundant supply by God, choose the abundance. Because it's not a blessing not to be able to feed your children. That's not a blessing. It's not a blessing to be so stressed out that you, you, you're so tempted to do unscrupulous things just to to keep food on the table, to keep a roof over your head, to, to have the insurance on the car paid or the car note. And so there are effects of sin that move down from one generation to another. So here's what happens is that when a father has a sinful lifestyle, the children are likely to practice that same sinful lifestyle. And that's what's visited down on the children is the inherited lifestyle that brought the curse on the father then brings the curse on the children because they do what they see. In other words, it helps to look at a curse not as a predestination. I want you to hear this clearly. A curse is not a predestination to sin. It is a weakness to sin. It's a weakness to sin. Like if your daddy or your mother was an alcoholic, you will naturally at birth have a weakness to alcohol. And the children, it is medically proven that the children of alcoholics can become an alcoholic from the first drink. That's a part of a curse or a weakness to the same sin that enslaved the parent. The same sin. It's just a weakness. It's not a predestination. That would make God unfair if God just made you, you know, be punished because of who you were born to. But thank God that he's made us curse breakers. Curse breakers. There's, there's a Jewish targum that specifies that this passage refers to ungodly fathers and rebellious children. That makes sense, doesn't it? ungodly fathers and rebellious children. Remember now, this was a sentence to those who hate God, not to those of us who love God. He says, I will visit this on those that, that hate me. I, this is the penalty that's going to come on them. This is a sentence to those who hate God, not those who love God. And so it's interesting that uh, the trend in the church world today is to try to blame every sin and every problem on some sort of generational curse. But in all honesty, that's not biblical. Because if you start believing that you're cursed, guess what you'll act like? Just like you're cursed. You know why? Because a believed lie is as powerful as truth. A believed lie is as powerful as truth. If a child grows up and hears, you're no good, and if they believe that, whether it's true or not, they'll act as though they are no good. They'll start acting it out if they believe it. But thanks be unto God, in John 8, 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Curse breaker. 
Ignorance binds, knowledge releases. By knowledge, God's people oftentimes are delivered. But God, God's warning here to visit the iniquity of future generations, this is a part of the Old Testament. A, general, uh, a generational curse was actually a consequent for a specific people, Israel, for a specific sin, idolatry. This was a curse for a specific people, Israel, for a specific sin, idolatry. And God judged them severely when they went into idolatry. And the history books of the Old Testament, especially the book of, of Judges, contains the record of God's divine judgment that came on Israel. But I want you to realize this truth. That the blood of Jesus breaks the curse, but we must correct the course. The blood of Jesus breaks the curse, but we must correct the course. In Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, This is the book of the generation of Adam, the generations of Adam. In that day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. It's interesting that the devil is going after generations. When he talks about generation, that word generation there refers actually to a body, a body of individuals born around the same time period. You know, I'm a baby boomer and that the baby boomers were children that were born in a certain period of time. And, and, and after us, I think, came uh, uh, the Gen Xers and and then the millennial generation, these are folks born at a certain period. And, 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 uh, and, and so you, you keep finding that if you're born in a certain period of time, you're classed as a part of a certain generation. And notice when it was uh, Genesis 5, 1 was saying, this is the book of the generations of Adam, those that were born within that certain period. But when you really understand the word generation, uh, generation means the act or process of procreation. It is the act or process of procreation when you generate something. Uh, it, it's the process of being formed, the generation of something, when you generate ideas and generate laws. It's, it's about reproduction, reproduction. When you have children, that's reproduction. It's it's. It's sexual intercourse because you, you, you can't have any of that without going through those channels. So this is another understanding of the word generation. So generation is about producing. It's about procreating. It's about creating something. The word regeneration really refers to being born again. The word regeneration, it refers to being born again. Re means again, and generare means to produce. Regenerate means to produce again. Regeneration means to produce again. It means to produce again. And have you ever noticed how uh, you've gone through an experiment? How many of you have ever sliced a, a, an earthworm in, in, in two and, and then both parts are now moving? And the thing can now grow another head. And it's, it's, it's multiple. There are certain species in the earth that can multiply just by cutting it. Just you, 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 you cut the thing in two and now all of a sudden instead of having one worm, now you've got two wiggling around. And another head grows on the one that you cut. That's regeneration. That's regeneration. And isn't it something that the moment that we are born again, immediately we want to tell everybody about the glorious Savior, Jesus Christ, who saved us. There's something I love, I love fr freshly saved people because their testimony is on fire. They want to tell people about, they want to, they want to get the whole world saved. People, I mean, when Jesus is coming to, to their heart, they, they, want to, they start talking to other folks about it. They immediately become productive. That's a part of regeneration. That's a part of regeneration. And when we serve and obey God, he causes us to generate things. When we serve and obey God, he causes us to generate things. And guess what? The devil specifically goes after generating people. 
The devil specifically goes after generating people. I wonder why some of our most talented artists, music artists, actors, they, they, they are, they're incredibly creative and the devil goes after them to attack it. Your, your most creative and talented child, be careful because the devil is going to go after them because they're going to start generating things. Uh, what we produce is not always just children, but we produce ideas. We produce businesses. We produce books. We produce movies. We produce music. We produce designs. We get patents on things. That's, that comes out of generations of when you start regenerating something. And the devil is always going to go after creative people. He's going to attack their minds with some type of mental disorder sometimes. He tries to attack them with depression. He's always going after generating people. He wants productive people. You will not find the greatest battle of the devil attacking people who don't have anything, who are living under a bridge. But if your life is producing something, if you're making a difference in the world, he's coming after you. He wants producing people. I mean, they, they, you know, I mean, if you got two cows and one of them produces 100,000 gallons of milk a year and the other one doesn't produce any, if, if a thief is coming, guess which one they're going to go after? The one that's producing. The devil goes after producing individuals, creative people. If, you've got, if you're one and ideas keep coming to you, businesses come to you, books come to you, movies, ideas and scripts. And, 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 and uh, uh, if you start hearing songs and music, the devil is coming after you. He's coming after you big time because you're a, a generator. You're a producer. He's coming after the generation. He goes after the generations. Goes after the generations. But here's the good news. Is you can stop the curse with your generation. You can stop the curse with your generation. There only needs to be one lamb for each home. Just one. Just one. Will you be that one lamb for your family? Will you be that one? Remember Exodus chapter 12 verse 13. That's, it just said, put the blood of a lamb over the doorpost of the home and the death angel will pass by. And if you don't want the devil to kill the creativity that is in your home, you got, he needs the blood of a lamb. He needs somebody that will stand and be that one lamb to say, God, I'm going to intercede for my family, not on my watch. Devil, you're not having my husband, my wife. My son, my daughter, my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, in the name of Jesus. Curse breakers. Will you, will you, will you be the one? Will you be the one? Will you be the one? And I'm just telling you, sometimes the devil will start whispering to a person that, listen, uh, you've messed up now. You've grown up. You've dealt with all of this. Do you think that you can do anything about that now? Uh, whenever you think that it is too late, that that's a trick of the devil. I came to prophetically remind you today, it's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late. I think that's why God let Abraham become a daddy at 99 years old and Sarah become a mother at 89 because he was reminding them it is not too late. I believe that that's why Elizabeth as an old woman got pregnant because it is not too late. I believe that that's why milk came in Naomi's bosom and she was able to nurse her grandbaby because it's not too late. It is not too late for you to start your business. It's not too late for you to go back to school. It is not too late for you to get your first house. It's not too late for you to write your first book. It is not too late. It is not too late for you to change careers. Who said you were too old to learn how to work a computer? The devil is a lie. It is not too late for you to have your baby. It's not too late for you to adopt. It's not too late for you to volunteer. It is not too late for you to be healed. It's not too late for you to get off of drugs. It's not too late for you to get off of alcohol. It's not too late for you to grow up and get out of your parents' house. It is not too late. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 says that he has redeemed us from the curse 
of the law because it had been written, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. And Jesus said, I'll show you a curse. He came to break the curse. And not only did he come to break the curse, he gave power to us. Power, power. To be able to break the curse in the lives of others. This was not just given to the 72 disciples. But he came and, 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 and said to us, listen, and these five signs shall follow them that believe. Not the apostles, not the prophets, not the evangelists, not the pastors, not the teachers. And these signs shall follow them that believe. The question is, are you a believer? And, and the very first sign that he said that will follow them that believe in my name. They'll cast out devils. You'll be a devil chaser and a curse breaker in the name of Jesus because the devil is going after the productivity in our houses, in the creativity of the minds of our sons and our daughters, the beauty of their spirits, the submission of their attitude. He's coming after them. He wants their respect. He's coming after the good stuff in your children. He's coming after your health. He's coming after the sanity of your mind. He's coming after the healthiness of your emotions. He's coming after your equilibrium. He is coming after you. But we have been given power to be able to break the curse of the devil. We have the power to be able to choose blessings over curses. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 and 20. Notice this. This day I called the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. You have the power to choose. One of the greatest powers that you possess is the power of choice. You have the power to choose blessings or curses, life or death. People choose it all the time. By what they put in their mouths. They're making a choice. Either what you eat is producing life or it is working a work of death in you. You put that choice every time you pull a fork or a spoon to your mouth. You're making a choice. You're making a choice. You're making a choice with everything you smoke. You're making a choice. You're making a choice with whatever you put into your veins. You are making a choice. You're making a choice. He said, I've set before you life and death. Blessings and cursing. You choose, he says. But he says, I'm encouraging you to choose life. Choose life so that not only you can live, but everything in your house. He says, because I'm looking for a lamb that won't be selfish, that just said that I'm satisfied to be saved. I'm not going to be satisfied until Pookie is saved, until Peanut is saved, until Leroy is saved, until Jimmy is saved, until Helen is saved, until Dorothy is saved. I'm not going to be satisfied. I am there to claim everything for my household in the name of Jesus. They can be acting like the devil and looking like the place where the devil lives. But in the name of Jesus, he has ordained you. You are ordained by God as a curse. Break us. Stand to your feet today. Stand to your feet. We're getting ready to declare some things. I'm looking for people today that will be a lamb over the house. That will stand with the authority and the voice of Jesus. To know and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. In my name. By my authority. He's saying to us, I'm giving you the power of attorney. I'm giving you the power of attorney to be able to declare some things that have been demonic, that have attached themselves to your family, and it goes down, physical illnesses, sugar diabetes, heart disease, all kinds of problems with the cells, addictions, pornography, drugs, alcohol, in the name of Jesus, mental retardation, uh, autism, in the name of the Lord Jesus the Christ, bipolar disorder, depression, depression, depression in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus are you ready I want you to decree this with me I want you to pray this prayer 
to be able to break generational curses. He's just looking for one person in the household to do something for the whole family. It begins in the realm of the spirit. It begins in the realm of the spirit. It begins in the realm of the spirit. That means some people that are in the household that don't even know what you're praying right now, but they will feel the effects. 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 We are battling hell coming through cell phones and computer screens in our homes. You're wondering where the devil came in. It's a window, it's a window, it's a window. We have opened portals to Satan in the name of Jesus. But I thank God that we've got the blood. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. Are you ready to decree it with me? Come on. Let's decree this in the name of Jesus. I want you to say it with me. Lord Jesus, I declare you are my Lord and Savior. I renounce any involvement in the works of darkness. I cancel every curse and ask you to forgive those who spoke them against me. Today, I proclaim liberty from every generational curse that existed in my bloodline. I repent for opening any doors of Satan to me or for granting access to any of my family. I repent for any of my family's sin so that I and my offspring will be released from any curse their disobedience may have brought against us. I renounce any ungodly beliefs, rituals, traditions, or customs they have practiced. I declare that every curse, hex, work of witchcraft, or voodoo against anyone in my family is made void by the blood of Jesus. I command every generational curse which manifests itself as sickness, depression, dysfunctional lifestyles, failed marriage, poverty, confused identity, addictions, or shady character to be uprooted and broken off me and my family now in Jesus' name. I accept your grace as a gift and decree that my family and I are protected by your peace. Thank you for setting me and my family free from every curse in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah to Jesus. You're ordained as a curse breaker. You take authority every time that you pray that God, everything that came out of my loins, everything God that has touched my roof, that we will finish what you've assigned to us. Our assignment will be complete, that we will be a godly testament in the earth. It doesn't matter how crazy your grandmother was and you're crazy your granddaddy or your mother or your father. It stops here. We draw a bloodline in the sands of time and begin to say, this is the generation of the Lord Jesus Christ for me and my family. It is a new day. This is the day. This is the generation that shall obey. God would raise up a generation and may we be those that will be the progenitors of a generation that will obey, that will rise up and live out our potential, that will rise up to destiny and character and strength and love and service and honor that we will be truth givers and bearers that will regenerate ideas and businesses and become productive and then go and set other captives free in the name of Jesus. I pray that God's spirit of power will rest on you. I couldn't get it all out in this message. We'll finish part two next week. You don't want to miss it. I'm going to capacitate you with four different things that will help you to be able to walk through this thing in strength and in power because the devil is a lie. I remember having to kill a snake and chopping it with a hoe and slicing its body and then the other part was still wiggling. And there's some thing that after you've attacked it, they're still wiggling in the body. But we've got to come back and strike it again 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 
and chip it up into pieces because the enemy is under our feet in the name of Jesus and we want to assault this thing giving it one blow after another chopping it cutting 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 every decision is an axe every decision every godly decision is an axe that cuts up that snake in various parts we're going to walk in power and in strength and i'm just declaring to you today it's a new day because some doors have been opened to satan and this is some stuff when you deal with demons psychiatrists don't know how to deal with that and sedating medications while they might calm the external nature of the body they have no power against the spirit that's on the inside spirits are not affected by natural medicine in fact part of the work of the enemy the power of the sorcerer the word in the Greek is pharmakia from which we get pharmacist and they work for mind control mind control with drugs that's why the drug addict needs deliverance they can't deliver themselves because the decision has been made for them they've opened the door and they've given control of the control room to an enemy and they keep doing things that even hurt their family the people that love them the most they keep hurting them and you wonder why why but you're calling ordained today as a curse breaker the process has begun it is a process it has begun a thing decreed shall be established the process has begun the craziness in the family the insanity in the family the sickness in the family the shame may i remind you that jesus took our shame upon him he took shame on himself for us the shame the shame, the shame brings guilt, fear, and hiding. Causes us to withdraw. But God wants to be able to use us for his glory. And he's looking for somebody that will be a curse breaker. And here, he sent out 72. But then Jesus said in these signs, shall follow them that believe in my name he released a whole army of his body of believers against every demonic stronghold and we're coming back into a time where just little positive messages are not going to bring it there needs to be a resurgence of the deliverance power of God and we're going to find some conditions in our society today that there is no cure for except the power of God and once again, once again, once again, once again, we're going to find some situations in our society that cannot be healed outside of God's power. Because its source is sin and demonic. And God goes to the source. He goes to the root. And he does it so that we and our children can live because it's killing us and it's shortening our lives and God wants us to live this is your day and I just want you to just when you go home you make a list of those folks in your family that you're standing and believing God for for their deliverance that they will get a divine visitation from heaven and that every satanic assignment against their life is cancelled we take authority over those things and we're going to walk you through a process. We got the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the word of our testimony, the power of prayer, of praise, the power of worship. And he's capacitated us to be able to be curse breakers. But remember, at the end of the day, don't get ecstatic over the fact that the demons are subject to us because of the name of Jesus and his blood. It's not what you do for him. It's what he has done for you. It's what he has done for you. It's what he has done for you. And our hearts rejoice 
in what God has done for us through Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful today for what God has done for us. A person would scarcely die for a righteous person, and yet he chose to die for sinners. I rejoice because my name is written in heaven. When I get to the gates of heaven, this, I don't get any brownie points for building a cathedral and an epicenter, an organization to help pastors and a Seeds of Excellence School. That, that's, 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 not, that's not on the, on the agenda. God is not going to look over our resumes when you get there. You don't get into heaven because of your resume. He's looking for a blood stain. <laughs> He's looking for the blood because I'm telling you, you can have all of this stuff. And I'm telling you, if you're not covered in the blood, the devil will take your educated mind and your accomplished body. And he will wreak havoc in your life and in your household. There's something that only the blood can handle. I thank God that the blood still has miraculous power, wonder working power, saving power, delivering power. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do. You do.